it means that it's a thing that you really need and it's a thing that you can't live without. I want to know about the world. When you have a right, you need to make sure that you have a responsibility to that right as well. If I have rights, then I can do lots and lots of stuff. If you don't learn about the world, you won't know what's going on about it. West Hill School in Wandsworth is a rights respecting school and has committed to teaching each year group about the rights they share with children around the world. It's about ensuring that they have an understanding of our community, especially in a school like ours. It's having an understanding about the rights of others that we can all value and learn from one another. They are from Africa, Asia, uh, Eastern Europe, England itself, and they're from a wide range of backgrounds. And they're fabulous because they come from a whole range of cultures, whole range of communities, and they form one community here at West Hill. Use the money to build schools. And rights basically are about the rights to education, the right to a clean environment, the right to be safe, to have fun, to enjoy, to relax, and the right to fulfil their potential so that when they come to school, every opportunity is presented to them and they're allowed to grasp that opportunity and make the best of that opportunity. It's something that we started working on about two years ago. It's first of all just making the children aware of the basic wants and needs that we have in, in society and then their rights and responsibilities. So we then started off in whole school assemblies looking at what's the difference between a want and a need. So I'd like a, a PlayStation 3 but I need water. It's given us a framework. I think we were halfway there before but what this has really done is help us pull everything together. The lesson is based upon a topic that we've been doing this term all about rivers and I thought that because we're doing work this year on rights respecting schools that I should include in some way in that topic how other people around the world don't have clean water and how lucky we are in the UK. Year 5, we are going to do a lesson today on water and think about global citizenship and I wanted to get you to think about the class charter and one of your rights that you said to me when we sat as a class was um, to have a drink of water and think about what might happen if you didn't drink enough water. I think it's extremely important to talk to, ch to, talk to children about it and to teach them about their rights and their responsibilities. They go hand in hand um, to educate the whole person. You know, I would be doing the children in my class an injustice if all I taught them was numeracy, literacy and science. Uh, they need to be aware of their rights and people around the world's rights and responsibilities as well. Jaron, what might happen if you don't drink enough water? You might be um, dehydrated. Good boy, good word. You might get dehydrated. Well, this morning we done a lesson on water, how people in Africa mainly don't have water and they have to travel miles of mainly walk to, to um, a standpipe. And I want you to have a look now at Article 24. Alexis, would you read it for us? Children have the right to good quality health care, to clean water, nutri nutritious food and a clean environment so that they will stay healthy. Rich countries should help poorer countries achieve this. What do you notice about this picture? Why might the tap be locked? Why do you think there might be a padlock on the tap? Very quickly, 30 seconds, chat to the person or people next to you. They don't really get water, have water. So they don't steal it. Yeah. What did you notice about the picture? Let's have some of your ideas. Corey. Um, I thought that there isn't enough water there, so they have to lock it to keep some for the rest of the people. They lock the tap because other people from different countries steal their water. I think that um, they put a padlock on it because um, when they send the water to them, the water just doesn't come bursting out, so they can save a little bit of water for some other people that are live far away to come and collect some of it. How do you think you would feel if your water supply was limited? How do you think you'd feel if your water supply was padlocked up? Have a quick chat to the person next to you. Um, I'm dizzy. Because you need to drink it and bathe in it. And if you don't drink that much, you'll dehydrate. And if it's dirty water, it will give you really bad illnesses. So, and um, if it's clean water, it'll be fine. And not many countries have that. And I'm going to ask Alexis. Um, Harry said he'll feel stressed because there'll be no water to have when um, the sun's out. And it's been really hot. So I just want you to start imagining in countries where the temperature is like this for most of the year round, 
how you would feel not to be able to go and get a drink of water whenever you felt like it. If it was me, I would feel pretty, pretty upset because it's not really fair because water is really, really important because I think 80% of our body is filled up with water and if you don't drink enough water, um, you, might be, you might faint, be sick or be dehydrated and in some, in some causes you might die really. So it's really, really important. This morning, I was lucky enough just to go to the tap and I filled up a two litre bottle of water so that you had an idea of what sort of quantities we were talking about. Having a bath uses 80 litres of water. Having a shower, I have a shower in the morning and I'm probably in the shower for about five minutes. Borhan, how long do you think you might be in your shower for? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, that's quite a long time for a shower. Every minute that you are in the shower, you use five litres of water. Who can do the maths for Borhan and work out if he is in the shower for half an hour, very clean boy, how much water is he using? 150. 150 litres, good boy. Borhan, that's a lot of water. The children are working on creative activities, including designing a board game and making posters to show what they can do to protect children's rights to water. I think it's really unfair because in, in this country, you have lots of water, but in the other countries, say for example, Africa, they don't really have much and there's loads of droughts sometimes. When I made the game, uh, as soon as the teacher told me that I had to make the game, I had this idea straight away that my, my idea was going to be based on Monopoly and it's going to do these things where you had to travel to Africa, help the people, donate money and stuff like that. I would really like to hear some of your ideas that you've come up with so far. On one of my squares it has get water from dirty swamp and um, on the game that's one of the bad parts of it. But on Further on, the, further on, a couple of squares later, there's, you have clean water from taps from out, community taps from outside that people can get, but that's only for a limited time. If only the time you can go around once, and then it stops. I drew the tap and said, turn off the tap when you brush your teeth. The next time you have a drink, next time you lift up your water, water bottle, be very thankful that it is so easy for you to have a drink of clean water. The children are very much aware that the rights that they are entitled to here in this school, in this community, in this country, are rights to share by children across the world. Whether or not they're allowed to uh, be involved in those rights and, and, and actually engage with those rights is another matter, and they learn that as well, which is equally important. I think that it was interesting when, when I've heard about some things going on in lessons and some assemblies, the children were shocked that children, other children in the world did not have clean water. And um, when we've talked about things like that, there are some children who get very emotional about it, but actually we're not trying to be emotional because we're not making judgments, we're not saying one's better than the other, but we're trying to think is anything that we can do as citizens in this school to make a difference. Here, they leave the tap on when they clean their teeth. They, you know, they, they just leave the taps on willy-nilly. However, the, for these children, a glass of water means the difference between life and death. And I think emotionally, they understand the needs of these children, and hopefully, they understand that they can actually affect change about this. And that's what I'm trying to, to, um, to help them with, is to how we actually, as individuals, can stand up and say, this is bad, and we know it's bad, but what can we now do to make it better? So, you know, uh, we start small when we're talking to three to 11 year olds, but at the same time, if they're starting to question and say, well, why is this happening? Why is this bad? And, you know, is there anything I as an individual can do? Then I think that's a, a really good thing if we've enabled them to do that. Not all children have rights because in parts of Africa and different lands as well, they um, don't have clean water or food. It's quite upsetting because nobody helps them either. And they, some people, like every day some, somebody dies there, so it's not nice. This year two group are thinking about the rights and responsibilities tourists have to help countries develop sustainably. choice 
for sustainable development. We're learning about sustainable development. Um, the idea is for children to make choices, responsible choices, um, that will help the local community that they're learning about to um, carry on with that development and manage it on, a, on their own um, in the future. What would that be like for all the animals? And, and all the animals when they cut the trees are homes for the animals. When they cut them down, they will um, the animals will die. Absolutely. So it wouldn't be sustainable, would it, for the environment? So now they've gone through this process of making all of these different decisions and thinking about why they're making the decisions. They're going to come up and share their choices with the rest of the class and explain the reasons why they've made those choices. Right, Nayab, would you like to tell us where you decided to get the money from for all of these brilliant developments? Get the money from the people who live there because it's better than getting it from the bank and then when you have enough money you have to give it back to the bank because you borrowed it from them. So it's better if you collect money and see how much you have and then if you have enough you can build like schools, buildings, hospitals. If they got a school they would learn about their rights and maybe they will get them. It's making um, them have a new school and they can learn. It is about empowering them as well. They are the, the future sort of generation that are going to be making choices for our country and for other countries. So they should feel empowered and they should feel a sense of responsibility and know that actually what they do can make changes and can make a difference. The school's rights respecting approach has also had a positive impact on the children's behaviour. Every time we talk about when we have anti-bullying things, which is not just one week in the year, we have it throughout, we talk about the right to play. We also talk about just the right to feel safe. If you have a right to be to play and you have a right to a good education, what do you need in order to achieve that? So rather than it being do's and don'ts and can's and can'ts, it's very much about, well, what's my right? What should I be entitled to do? And how can I ensure that that right is, is recognised across the board? Go away! What's wrong? Jaron is a member of our peer support scheme. Children in years five and six can apply to be buddies and their role very much is to work with younger children and they go out into the playground and they support positive play, they support inclusive play. This is something you need to say to him, Dan. Sorry. And very much just being a person to tell and they're very much recognised as somebody that they go to and say, I'm not feeling very happy, so and so is being unkind, and then they can take the next step uh, to help those children solve the problem. You chose that one because... Um... I want them to, to be, know that they have a right, that they have a voice in society and that their voice is valued and that with that voice comes a responsibility. So your voice will be heard if you act and say things that are responsible. I want them to be able to make the right choices in their lives, to have a really good life. It's about really being part of the whole world and, and the global community because we are a small school in the middle of Wandsworth doing rights respecting, but actually I do have this belief that they're going to make a difference to the world. It has made me think differently as a, as a human being about some things that I want and some things that I need and I think if I can start to learn, I'm sure children are much better at learning than I am, so hopefully they'll make a difference. If everyone had rights, then I would be kind of really happy. But I don't know why, I just would be really happy. Right now, the world is not fair because people in different places, they don't get their rights. So it would be nice if everyone had their rights.